The Inventive Podcast, mixing engineering fact and fiction. Inventive. 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 With Trevor Cox, Professor of Acoustic Engineering at the University of Salford. Welcome to Inventive, where I chat to an engineer and ask a writer to create a story inspired by that conversation. My guest on this week's episode is structural engineer Roma Agaral. Now, she's probably best known for her work on the skyscraper The Shard in London, or maybe her book Built, The Hidden Stories Behind Our Structures. She brings both a global and a personal perspective to engineering and architecture and how they influence our lives and our emotions. Later, you'll hear a short story by author C.N. Taylor, which he wrote after hearing what Roma had to say. Because that's what we do on Inventive. Mix engineering fact and fiction. I have been known to stroke concrete. (laughs) I love kind of feeling it. My personal wish for a superpower is... Just as Magneto from X-Men can control steel and make steel bend to his will, I would love to have the equivalent powers over concrete to be able to swish the concrete around into whatever shape I want. You want a wonky tower? Yes, to save my town. I can't. Why? There are limits. I'm the boss of concrete. I can swish it round into whatever shape I want, right? But I'm not the boss of physics. You know, concrete has this incredible history and you can almost treat concrete as a person, as a character, with characteristics, personality. It's For me, it's very much about how can I bring storytelling techniques to what appears to be a dry subject. Behind me, a low rumbling sound struck up, preceding the arrival of a cement lorry. I'm not the police, or a journalist, and I don't work for this cement works, I said, nearing. Who are you, then? I'm Roma Agrawal. I'm a structural engineer, author and broadcaster. You're probably best known for your work on the Shard. Can you outline what you were doing there? And the challenges you faced and had to overcome while working on it? Um, Yeah, that's a big question. And... It almost seems like a lifetime ago now because I was involved in designing the foundations of the building. I must have been about 23 or 24 years old. and It was the second ever project that I worked on. Um, The foundations of a skyscraper are clearly a very important part of it because if the foundations don't work very well, then you get the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And clearly that's not why you want people coming to visit your structure. So... The basement of the Shard is about three stories deep, which takes it to about 20 metres. And we had to basically kind of slot it in within a very busy urban landscape. So if you think about it, there's a brick viaduct, which dates back to the 19th century on one side. There was a train station on the other side, one of the busiest train stations in Europe, a bus station, a hospital across the street. And of course, there were tube lines that ran underground as well. So finding the space and then inserting this deep basement without destabilizing all these structures around us was a massive challenge. So that's one of the big things that I worked on on the building. I mean, you're a structural engineer. So when you say you worked on the foundations, what were you actually doing? Yep. So in really simple terms, a structural engineer is responsible for making sure that buildings and bridges stand up. So we basically use maths and physics and numbers to think about all the forces that are attacking the structures. So gravity is pulling it downwards, you know, wind is pushing it sideways, and some places earthquakes are going to try and rattle it. That's not the case in the UK, luckily. So we basically convert all of these forces into numbers. We then think about what materials we want a structure to be built from. So in the case of foundations, it's generally concrete because concrete is a very robust material and we can work on it so that it resists water and you know corrosion and so on. And then we basically put bits of concrete in the right places so that it's strong enough to resist those forces that I just described um, and keep the building stable. And I guess when you dig into a very old and existing city like London, do you find surprises when you actually get on site and start digging down? Are there things there you weren't expecting? You can. Um, so there are a few different things you can encounter. One is 
things like Roman archaeology. And I think with the crossrail excavations of this big new train line, they were finding plague pits and so on. So you can find bits of archaeology. Another really fascinating and scary one is unexploded devices from World War II. So we've got these maps that tell us about the likelihood of finding an unexploded bomb, but clearly that's something we have to be really, really careful about. And in the case of the Shard, something that unexpected happened was the actual ground layers. So we knew that there was some stuff on the top that we call made ground, then there was a big thick layer of clay, and then you go down to a really strong compressed solid layer of sand, and this sand was going to be one of the big mechanisms that was going to absorb the big loads from the tower. And what we found that there was an ice age fault in the site, so that you had the layers kind of just almost dropping down a number of meters and then continuing on. I mean, luckily that didn't actually make much of a difference because all it meant was that some of our foundations needed to be a little bit deeper. But, you know, those are just some of those things that can happen when you're working on a construction site. That's quite amazing to sort of to not know what's there. And I guess, you you know, as you walk around now, you can be really proud because it's, it's still there as you walk around. I mean, what's it like working on this big, iconic landmark that you must go past a lot of times? I mean, I think that's one of my favourite parts about being an engineer is the fact that you're working on real life things that go up there and that you can see and you can touch and you can walk into and travel up and down. But also that it forms a part of the city, the landscape, you know, that people from all over the world are experiencing something that you contributed to. And I don't think there's that many professions where you really get that sense of, I made this real thing that people are going to interact with. And it's extremely, extremely rewarding. I mean, it strikes me that you must walk around the city and and see things in a different light to how I look at them. I I noticed on your Twitter feed, your Friday's fun photo is an external (laughs) strut helping with the stability of a tower. (laughs) Um, My Friday fun photos have been running for a long time now. Um, Absolutely. I come back from my holidays with photos of arches and beams and skyscrapers and bricks and all kinds of stuff and I think that there is a real beauty in being able to see the city through the eyes of an engineer which is which is almost the tagline for the book that I wrote um, which is called Built and the idea behind the book that I wrote the podcast which I've done um, the children's book that I have coming out next year all the kind of the speaking the engagement the inspiration work that I try and do the advocacy and so on is really to show people and particularly young people that engineering is all around them and if they want to try and make a difference in the world in some way then engineering is an amazing option for them to consider. So as I, as I wander around the, the city, so being a sound person, I wander under archways and go, oh, the acoustics of my footsteps have changed. That's the sort of thing I observe. So what, what, what's catching your eye? Um, materials catch my eye a lot. So I, um, I have been known to stroke concrete because <laughs> I love the texture of concrete. I love kind of feeling it because as a material, it's such an interesting material. So I'm always thinking about... Um, concrete or brick. I love looking at all this really old brick around me, um, considering that bricks are a 10,000 year old technology, that the materials used to make the brick can be up to 50 million years old. And so I'm, I'm thinking when I touch brick that I might be touching like the fossils of, of life that is long extinct in the world. Um, the other thing I do is actually try and take notice of what I can't see. So what lies behind that brick or that glass facade? What lies beneath the street? What's under my feet? You know, are there sewage tunnels? Are there cables? You know, what what is all of this infrastructure that actually forms the city? Because it really kind of blows my mind when I think about how utterly complex it is to put a single building together, let alone put together, you know, a, a great functional um, thriving city. I mean, it sounds to me like if I was to grant you a superpower, I ought to grant you some X-ray specs so you could walk along the street and, and look at the tunnels and the sewage below you. I, I like that idea, but my personal wish for a superpower is just as Magneto from X-Men can control steel and, and you know make steel bend to his will, I would love to have the equivalent powers over concrete. Um, I love the idea that 
concrete as a material starts off as rock and then we burn that rock down, we mix it up with water and with other stuff and then it becomes a liquid. And this liquid is indeterminate, you know, its shape is indeterminate, it can be whatever we want it to be. And so I want to basically to have the superpower to be able to kind of swish the concrete around into whatever shape I want. So you, you mentioned earlier on, I mean, when you worked on the Shard, you were quite young, maybe one of the younger people on the team. What was your journey to get to that point? I had a bumpy journey into structural engineering, an unusual and twisted journey. Um, there isn't just one way to get in there. I grew up in the US and in India. In India, in particular, studying science and maths was seen as a path to getting a prestigious career. So it was very natural and normal that I loved maths and science. I came to the UK when I was 16 to do my A-levels and I studied maths and science and design. Um, So this is where the funny thing starts and where being a woman kind of affected my career even before it started was that no one ever suggested to me to even consider engineering as a career. I'm sure if a boy was studying maths, further maths, physics and design and technology, someone would have said to him, oh, have you thought about studying engineering? But no one ever said that to me. And I ended up studying physics at university. I, l- I loved physics. Um, I loved the idea of solving problems. And I loved the idea that we don't have the solutions to all the problems. And that was really exciting. But at some point, physics became a bit too almost nebulous for me. And I really wanted to do practical things and make stuff with, you know, almost with my hands and create stuff. And I happened to be working one summer earning some cash um, in the physics department at my university. And I had a horribly boring job, but I was surrounded by engineers. And that's when it hit me that engineering brings together the maths and science with the practicality and, and the making stuff. And I said, right, that's what I want to do. So I did a master's in structural engineering for one year. And then basically I I found that incredibly, incredibly difficult because everyone else on my course had an undergraduate degree in engineering except me. So I was starting from a whole different level, but I passed and I got a graduate position. And, you know, as they say, the rest is history. And uh, when you were working on the Shard, you were the only women in the team. I mean, did that cause any issues? Um, So I was one of very few women on the team. There were certainly a few women around. I would say in a broader sense that if you're in any kind of minority in a big team, then it can have an effect on your confidence. And I certainly found that in my earliest meetings that I was attending, you know, I would just sit there quietly and not say anything with this assumption, who was I to speak up and express my thoughts or opinions or ideas what did I know and it took me a little bit of time to get over that Um, another thing that I found slightly interesting and and very uncomfortable early on in my career and this was across various different projects that I worked on about 15 years ago was I would go to construction sites or steel fabrication yards and they still had pictures of naked women on their walls because they were just so unused to any women visiting and being part of the technical team and I mean that wasn't uncomfortable just for me it was uncomfortable for the men involved it's just frankly unprofessional and I have to say that I haven't seen that in a long time but I didn't feel that I could speak up about it because I felt people would just kind of reinforce that idea that oh you know you see what a problem women create when they come on site so I've definitely been in a number of awkward and you know, uncomfortable situations like that through my career. Uh, I mean, it's sad to hear. My, my wife actually trained as a joiner after she did her degree and, and was on site and she met exactly the same kind of things. And there was this uh, kind of attitude among some of them that that's how sites were. Absolutely. And, and that's definitely how I felt for the first half of my career is that it was about me having to change myself and adapt myself to the reality of the industry. Um, The PPE, so the high-vis jackets, the trousers, the hard hats or whatever I had to wear to keep myself safe, the shoes in particular, wouldn't fit me. And so I would be kind of stomping around in stuff that's supposed to keep me safe, but actually feeling quite unstable on my feet. There was all these little little niggles that add up over time, I guess. Um, But obviously on the flip side, there are also, I would say, advantages of being different in the industry. And what are those then? (laughs) So I think... um, people remember you. So I might be sitting around a table with, 
I, I think the the most I remember was 21 men and probably two of them were called John and three of them were called Dave and there was a couple of Pauls and so <laughs> I was the only woman there I was the only person of color there I was younger than anyone else there but that means people remember you and that is an advantage because it allows you to build relationships so it just makes you stand out a little bit which in some cases you can also use that um to your advantage um i mean one thing i'm just slightly changing uh tack here looking at some of the you know the interviews with you online is you're very open about the struggles you've had with conceiving your daughter and postnatal depression that uh, you experienced afterwards and i was thinking the impact the built environment has on our experiences so individually and collectively mm. it's a really fascinating thing so I actually happened to be in a taxi and I was driving down the street that I used to walk down before I went to my IVF appointments and something happened to my stomach. And it was funny how being in that same space two years later had such a strong kind of emotional reaction with me because of the association. And then equally, there are places that I find myself in where I'm suddenly awash with really positive emotions and experiences because again of of some memory so the built environment absolutely has a massive impact on how we live and how we feel and so on and with with the depression and so on people used to say to me try and get out of the house once a day and quite close to where i live is what used to be exclusively a church and it still operates as a church but the vicar in the church found out that oh the post office on our high street was about to close so he said why don't you open the post office inside our church and then a big soft play area opened up and then there was a cafe and you get great homemade coffee and cakes there and that became a real place of peace reflection getting away from my home which were all i guess original intentions for places of religious worship i am not religious personally but what that particular um institution showed to me is that if you adapt and you can think about what the changes in your society are and are happening around you then you can still create extremely inclusive places where people can find that peace and solace that are kind of relevant to this this different and new context do you think becoming a mother has changed your approach to engineering Again, a very interesting question. And in some ways, I don't know if I can even answer that at the moment because I haven't strictly gone back into my engineering career after having my baby. So for the first time in 15 years, I'm actually self-employed and then I'm writing as my full-time occupation. So I think the change that has happened is that it has given me a new view of engineering it has given me you know this different perspective and how that's going to translate into my work for example is that i'm going to write about the breast pump as an innovation in engineering in my new book i'm going to write about microscopes but i'm going to write that from the perspective of you know how do you put a single sperm and an egg together to create life you know that isn't that the ultimate kind of engineering accomplishment that we can literally create life so I think it's even more magnified the human aspect of engineering for me. Yeah, you've you've got a real skill obviously in writing and making engineering very accessible, particularly in an area like structural engineering, which I think many people might I mean it's an old joke, isn't it? Civil engineering see boring in the yellow pages. You know, structural <laughs> engineering sounds like a very necessary but not very exciting and yet you you've you've really made it exciting and you know, your book's gone around the world and it has rave reviews yeah, thank you thank you i really appreciate what you're saying about my work I mean, what, um, how, what's your trick there i i think it's about storytelling it's as simple as that i think we forget first of all that engineering is for humans but also um i i kind of try to <laughs> try to use the skill where i try and turn anything into a story so a con you know concrete can have a story it has this incredible history and you can almost treat concrete as a person as a character with characteristics personality and history and tell that story 
So it, it's for me, it's very much about how can I bring storytelling techniques to what appears to be a dry subject. Well, I couldn't agree more. That's just what the Invented Podcast is all about, mixing fact and fiction. Inventive. Now, when I had this idea for Inventive, I wanted to tell some of the wonderful engineering stories that we don't ever hear in the mainstream media and to bring, as Roma says, storytelling techniques to what might appear to be a dry subject. Now, we invited the author C.M. Taylor to listen to Roma's interview and write a piece of fiction based on it. And yes, it was the concrete that caught his interest. The Night Builder by C. M. Taylor Although I did not notice at the time, bogged down as I was in turgid council business, the first inkling of the events which were to transform my dilapidated seaside town into a place of global fame, and in so doing, loosen the bonds of my own mournful emotional life, was a news report of the perplexing overnight appearance of a 40 metre tall concrete mangrove tree on the fourth plinth of London's Trafalgar Square. To Londoners accustomed to their plinth being variously adorned with sculptures of bronze thumbs, of blue chickens and of horse skeletons, the appearance of such an unusual object was not even, well, that unusual even if its extraordinary height had Nelson himself squinting across from his column over into the canopy. But when the office of the Mayor of London came out to say it had definitely not commissioned the huge concrete tree, a tree deemed by the Royal Horticultural Society, after punctilious investigation, to be a perfect likeness of the sweet-scented apple mangrove in every single way, bark, leaves, flowers, fruit, then it was clear that something very much was up. The second sign, and this I did notice, heard it on the radio one Saturday morning, finishing up some financially perilous council paperwork, was a five-storey concrete helter-skelter appearing overnight in the car park of a shuttered shopping centre in a high-rise part of inner-city Leeds. In quick succession, and by now the source of these concrete improvisations was being nicknamed in the press as the Night Builder, the Blue Circle, the Dark Mixer. There materialised a small concrete chapel adjacent to a small concrete mosque in the unused side garden of a Cardiff nursing home, a concrete youth club on the site of a derelict bothy on the outskirts of Salty Peterhead, and a much-needed concrete annex to the much-loved Thetford Library. That Sunday, I lay in bed until mid-afternoon. Something I had done often in the blissful early days of my marriage, but never done since the descent of my tragic solitude. That Sunday, I contemplated the ceiling above my bed and I meditated on these concrete buildings materialising impossibly across the country. And I hit upon a plan. I won't be in for a couple of weeks, I told my council secretary Jim, as I entered my office on the promenade on the Monday morning. He looked up quizzically. After all, I was a known workaholic, and had not taken a holiday, nor even left the town since my husband and daughter had been swept out to sea some twelve years before. Anything wrong? Jim asked. Nothing wrong. I just need to go on a mayoral trip. There is a travel fund included in my allowable expenses, is that right? I knew there was, I had checked. But I waited for Jim to verify. Yes. He pulled up a file on the computer he was working on squinted at a spreadsheet. £7,000 a year. He leaned back in his chair, peered up at me. A fund you've never touched before, Lady Mayor, we usually give it to the hospital. And I am at liberty to withdraw all that from the expenses account? 
Yes, but do you mind me asking? I do mind, yes, I said, and I walked out of the mayoral office. I didn't want yet to tell. For many reasons, but chiefly in case I failed. Out on the deserted promenade, sea spray lashed up the breakwater, aiming itself at grim, pugilistic goals. But beyond that, no movement could be seen. Shuttered cafes and B&Bs stretched out either side of the office behind me. Not one soul had ventured out. Shouldering my overnight bag, I walked to the station and took the first train to London. I had decided not to visit the fourth plinth. Its height and visibility made the risk of my being seen and stopped too high, so on arrival I simply took another train, this one east to Thetford later approaching that town's library on foot and bending down to chip surreptitiously a small flake off its wall with the chisel I held concealed up my sleeve. Bagging up the sample, I returned to the train station and made my way to Leeds, obtaining another bagged surreptitious concrete sample, this time from the thronged helter-skelter, before travelling north again to Peterhead now, obtaining a third concrete sample from the library in what is traditionally known as the middle of the night, but at a time actually closer to dusk than it was to dawn. If my B&B host in Peterhead was surprised to be woken by an unbooked stranger's staunch rapping on their window, they betrayed no such emotion, and I was able to take some sleep before the long journey south to Cardiff where a fourth sample was taken from the mosque, a fifth from the chapel, and a courier summoned to bike the samples at haste to a chemical analysis lab in the Welsh capital. I did not sit and wait impatiently for the results of the express chemical sample analysis I had commissioned, but instead, following through my plan, I journeyed west through Wales to the port of Holyhead, where I boarded a ferry to Dublin. My plan, such as it was, ran as follows. While the first mysterious concrete construction to appear had graced the capital London, since then, the night builder, the name on which the press had now settled, had progressed to build in the north of England, to build in Scotland and in Wales, a pattern suggesting that Ireland was next, where it was my firm intention to catch them in the act. But how? Well, as the ferry progressed and the land ahead configured itself to Dublin, the report from the chemical analysis appeared on my phone. It was just as I had hoped. Each of the five concrete samples I had submitted showed a very particular mix of concrete. A certain type and percentage of lime, a certain type and percentage of cement, and so on. The night builder... This maestro of the form had a favoured recipe. And as each cement mixing works had their own house mix, it was not long before I was able to determine which works in Ireland, the night builders predicted next stop, habitually mixed the favoured tipple. Happily, there was just one such works. Departing Dublin in a hire car, I drove west across Ireland to the town of Sligo, parked up outside the cement works and hunkered down with food and drink and the intention to wait indefinitely. But my wait was not to be onerous, was neatly prescribed in fact by the arrival at exactly 11.30pm, so the digital clock embedded in my dash informed, of an estate car whose solitary male occupant stepped out and unlocked the cement works gate before checking his phone and peering off into the darkness. Soon enough, behind me a low rumbling sound struck up, preceding the arrival of a cement lorry, which halted beside the waiting man. A dark arm shot out from the open lorry window to hand cash to the man, who, pocketing it, returned to his car, disappearing quickly. As the cement lorry drove inside, I climbed from my hire car and followed. 
there was to be no hedging nor dodging. In life, I am reticent until I am direct, and tonight I needed to be direct. Inside the cement yard, the lorry was being reversed into position beneath the exit chute of the corrugated cement silos. Night, builder! I shouted over the rumble, approaching the lorry on foot. Night, builder! I called again. A balaclavered face craned from the lorry's driver's side window, framed eyes regarding me dispassionately. I'm not the police, or a journalist, and I don't work for this cement works, I said, nearing. Who are you then? the night builder asked, her voice steady, more intrigued than anxious. I told her who I was, the mayor of a recessional, increasingly dilapidated seaside town, a town going to seed around me just as I ran to seed within it, a town in great need of something to bring in the crowds, to cause a buzz. The night builder now eased open the driver's side door as I spoke. She stepped down from the cabin and approached me, dressed head to toe in cement grey, as much H&M as trad superhero garb. I've tried everything, I continued. We've asked Anthony Gormley for a statement piece. We've asked Anish Kapoor. Neither replied. So, you're gormless, quipped the night builder. Suffering capovity, I replied. I saw a smile crease her grey balaclava. So what exactly do you want? She said. I hesitated. Closed my eyes. Remembered the last holiday I had taken with my husband and daughter. Before the water claimed them. I remembered the Italian bell tower I stood beneath. One arm around my husband. One around my girl. Looking up at the famous structure as it tilted away almost comically by the old town's cathedral. I opened my eyes and looked right at her. I want a leaning tower. What? Pisa is one of the most famous towns in the world, has millions of visitors because it's got a wonky tower. You want a wonky tower? Yes, to save my town. I can't, she said. Why? She sighed, paused. There are limits. I'm the boss of concrete. I can swish it round into whatever shape I want, right? But I'm not the boss of physics. If gravity wants to pull something down, it will. The wonky Pisan Tower is luck. An unrepeatable, precarious balance between foundations and mass and gravity. If you set out to make something that gravity almost pulls down, Chances are high it will fall. Damn. I looked right at the night builder, but she did not look back. Instead, just eyed the concrete silos behind me. I need to get on, she said. Just think about it, please. But there was no reply. I traipsed out of the cement works, Drove east across Ireland, taking a ferry and then three trains to arrive home defeated and exhausted the next day, vowing not to talk of my failed adventure, vowing to deflect and shun the curiosity of my secretary Jim and those others on my staff whom he had undoubtedly told. The night builder's work in Ireland was another blazing success a beautiful, slender footbridge across Sligo's Garavogue River, linking an old people's home on one side to a public park and primary school on the other, and I read and watched everything I could about her latest masterpiece of clandestine civic benevolence, hoping for one of my own. Hoping less, though, 
through the end of that summer and on into the skin-stinging autumn, with hope then exhausted as later I walked each winter day along the dilapidated promenade to stare in brooding grief at the place in the sea where my darlings had drowned. On the thirteenth anniversary of their death, I awoke not with the leaden trepidation which I now habitually brought to that dreaded day, but with a fizzing, puzzled curiosity. My room sounded different somehow, was filled with a hive of distant, lively sounds. I got out of bed, walked to the window, and threw back the curtains to see my street in buzzing conclave, people rushing from their houses in ones and twos, moving excitedly down the road towards the shore. I checked my silenced phone, there were fourteen messages from Jim, then hurled on some clothes and made for the front door. A hand-delivered envelope was wagging half in, half out of the letterbox. The words, Open me tonight, penned on its front. Stuffing the envelope in my pocket, I quickly left the house, joining the tributaries of people until soon. I stood with most of the town, it seemed, in an awestruck huddle on the promenade. The sight in front of us was magnificent. Embedded into the shingle beach of my dull hometown, there now stood a perfect concrete copy of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Thrusting eight precariously tilting stories high into the winter sky, the tower was topped by a bell chamber and circled by thuggish gulls. Arches piled on top of arches ringed the girth of the immaculate, impossible tower as the whole town stood and stared, as the press began to arrive, as the whole world, I felt and I knew, began to hear for the first time the name of my decaying little home. I closed my eyes and pictured myself again in Pisa, beside my husband and my girl alongside many tourists. Tourists, or people like them, who'd even now be making excited way to our once dreary corner, to stand and to marvel at our miracle tower, and to spend their cash at the chip shop, and on coffees, and on cakes, and ice creams in the hotels, in the cafes, in bars. Already, the town was returning to life. And did I feel that life coming back to myself? Feel for the first time a lessening of my grief? Perhaps I did, but... Get ready! A voice boomed behind me, and I turned my head, as all others also turned theirs, to see a grey-clad figure standing on the roof of the mayor's office behind us on the promenade. I recognised her immediately, the night builder, in her concrete grey balaclava. Get ready, she shouted. It's going to go. I looked back over to the tower, realising only then that there was nobody stood around its base, seeing only then that access to the beach had been fenced off and that all the town was confined to the promenade with not one soul down on the shingle shore. Here we go, the voice of the night builder shouted behind us, as now there came a terrible tearing sound, a sound that turned to a whistling and a screeching sound of air being shoved down, and we watched, dumbfounded, as our new immaculate tower fell quickly, collapsing away from the land and over into the sea, one long column of perfect concrete falling down to meet one lengthening column of shadow, as our replica Pisan landmark crashed into the water scarcely hours after first it had stood. The slap of concrete onto water, and the bubbling of submersion. The silence of the crowd. Amazement. 
awe. The fallen tower lay in half on the shingle now, and half toppled out into the sea. My eyes scoured for the night builder along my office roof, but I saw that she had gone. That evening, I sat frazzled in my office, a frantic day of police and of media and of all the busybodies of the town and the county, and I remembered the note I'd found at my house. I reached into my pocket and read, I thought that a falling tower would do the job you wanted just as well as a leaning one. As I said, I can beat concrete, but I can't beat physics. Later, alone, I walked down the promenade and over to the shore, and I saw locals standing around the toppled tower, saw kids clambering up its arches to play King of the Castle, saw a family pick their way right down it, then cast a crab line into the water. Cars stopped behind me, and people got out to stare. Selfies were taken, laughter rang out. Life. As the months passed, and as fish swam in and out of the fallen arches, and as barnacles prospered and seaweed grew along it, people came in their droves to see the fallen tower, and the town grew plumper and commodious. I had done my job. I resigned. I had been a good mayor. And on nights now, when my loneliness grows fretful, I can walk across the promenade down to the shore and mount the fallen tower, walking down to the place where the concrete meets the sea. And there I can feel somehow as close to my darlings as ever I did. That was The Night Builder by C.N. Taylor. I really love the concrete Banksy figure in that story. The idea of engineer as disruptor is something we should talk about much more. Just look around you at all the engineering that has fundamentally changed how we live. Cars, mobile phones and even concrete. What pieces of engineering do you think are hidden in plain sight or should be celebrated more? Let us know at www.inventedpodcast.com or get us on all the usual socials. Inventive. Let's return to the interview again and get Roma's perspective on how structures can affect communities and also her profound feeling for the deeply personal relationships that we form with our built environment. A theme that really resonates now in these socially distanced and isolated times where we're spending so much time in our homes. It's fascinating, isn't it, that your basis of structural engineering is all about solving these equations and dealing with materials, and yet it has so many connections to to the human. It does, and I think when you're training um, and then you start kind of sitting there with your codes and with your calculator and your computer models, that you can often start to forget that. You know, when we design our structures, I think it's important to remember that there are humans going to be inside it. It isn't just about steel and concrete. That situation is really relevant to the lockdown and the pandemic, where we're all largely locked in our houses, where we're not going to meet up in these shared built environment spaces. Yes, um, it's it's really going to give people a pause for thought about design and what are the kinds of places that people are going to want to live in. Well, when we design our homes, our buildings, our, you know, common courtyards or our playgrounds and and our gardens and so on. How would those feel if we got locked in again for a number of months? So um, one of the things we're sort of, one of the challenges we're facing up to is the need to build more buildings, especially homes. I mean, it's it's regularly in the news, isn't it, about there not being enough homes around. I mean, are we all going to end up living in high-rise blocks? Um, I think the short answer is no. I think... 
you know, there is generally a trend towards coming into the city. And I wonder how the pandemic is going to affect that. That's something that people are still kind of looking into. But the general trend is that people are moving into cities. And I think the statistics say that about 80% of the world's population will live in cities by 2050, which is absolutely incredible. There are different ways that we can live. But I do think from an environmental sustainability point of view, the, the denser the cities are, the less that they're encroaching on the nature around them, the better. And so that will mean a mixture of different types of residences. So I think we will continue to see you know, family homes. We will see the high rises as well. But in between that, I think we will see more medium rises in cities like London, you know, buildings which are between six and ten storeys, for example, which can really um, have a big impact on the density of the city while still making it feel not overcrowded. I guess it needs to work on a human scale, doesn't it, as, as well as on a sort of just a simple let's get the density up. And, and improve uh, sustainability? Um, it, it does. It has to work on the human scale. But bringing my kind of global perspective into this, people have been living in very dense and very high situations around the world for a very long time. And I always think that, you know, people's preferences for how they live is a lot of what they're used to, what they've been exposed to. So people that live in Manhattan, that live in Hong Kong, that live in Shanghai, that live in Mumbai, which is, you know, where I grew up, we're very used to living on top of each other. And, you know, I personally have amazing memories of living in a multi-story building with you know, 50 plus families. And we used to all, all the kids used to go down and play in the garden and the courtyard almost every single evening. So it was a very kind of community vibe to my childhood. So I think in the UK, we have this automatic assumption that tall is bad or, you know, high rise is bad. And I would really like for people to challenge themselves to that because I don't think that that's necessarily the case. So the, the desire for your three bedroom semi, which is what I'm actually interviewing you from, it is kind of a cultural thing rather than there being some deep down emotional desire to live in something a bit smaller. I mean, after all, if you look over our history of a, a long time span, we weren't living in very tall buildings, were we, up until relatively recently in terms of human evolution? So I'm, I'm going to challenge you on that because the Romans were building 10 storey apartment blocks 2000 years ago. And there was a point where the majority of the Roman population in Rome were living in high rise compared to living in single family dwellings. So it's certainly not just, you know, it's not an intrinsic biological quality in humans that we have to live in a particular way. It, it, it is cultural, it is contextual. It's what is available, what materials are available in a particular country, what techniques are available in that particular country. And people have been living in different ways all over the world for a very, very long time. Well, I, I stand corrected. Then. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you mentioned your, your different cultural background. Uh, how does that affect your work? I mean, does it change how you approach problems or how you work to creatively solve issues? So I'm um, Indian. I've lived in the US and in India till I was 16. And I came into this country as an immigrant about 20 or 21 years ago now. And I think just having a bit more of a global background makes you appreciate that there are lots of different ways of doing things. And it makes me perhaps question a bit more that, oh, OK, fine, you've been doing it this way in the UK for many, many years. But have you thought about doing it this different way that I saw happening in India or that I may have picked up when I was traveling in the US or anywhere else? And I think it just gives you that little level of humility and awareness that there isn't just one way of doing things. And I think that that can be a real strength when you're trying to design for obviously what's a very diverse population. Yeah, I mean, think about diversity. I mean, where, where, when in time or where in place do you think the greatest culture of engineering has been? That is um, a very tricky question to answer. And the reason it's tricky is because engineering is so utterly an intrinsic part of of humans and the way we've lived right from the beginning that it's difficult to say that engineering was great at this time and kind of went away at a different time because if you literally think about the earliest humans that picked up a stone and used it as a tool or found a cave to make it their home that is engineering and that has always continued throughout humanity we've always sought to 
improve technology, create technology and make our lives better, more convenient, you know, create possibilities for ourselves. Um, and the other thing that strikes me is that different cultures had different sort of heydays of engineering. Around the Middle Ages was the golden age of science and engineering in the Arab world. And then you had incredible engineering from the ancient world in the Indus Valley civilization or the Roman civilization, which came thousands of years later. So I feel like overall on our planet and among humans, there has always been a golden age of engineering, but maybe just in different places. So it's almost a, an unfair question. And you're almost saying it's intrinsic to be human, to be an engineer. Yeah, I, I think it is. And I think that we have this label or this stereotype of the word engineering and engineer. But to me, it is literally every human made object around us is engineered. And every time you just pick some tool or material up and change it in some way and use it in a new way, that that's engineering. So I yeah, every time we do something to change a material around us, we are being engineers. The Inventive Podcast, mixing engineering fact and fiction. Roman Agrawal, thank you so much for doing the interview. It's been really great talking to you. Good luck with your writing. Thank you so much, it's been great. Well, I, I feel that that conversation with Roma has really broadened and deepened my engineering horizons. And I've had some of my preconceptions challenged, not least about Roman history. It's great to have Roma's insight, her international and cross-cultural perspectives, and her personal intense engagement with engineering and the buildings around us. And, of course, that all-important material, concrete. Next time in Inventive, we'll be soaring into the skies and diving deep underwater with aerospace engineer and self-confessed mermaid Sophie Robinson. Author Tony White pens a tale of wild swimming that explores some of the ethical dilemmas of engineering. We'd love to have your thoughts about the fact, the fiction and a mixture of the two. Maybe you know an engineer we should feature in a future podcast. Get us on all the usual socials or go to our website www.inventivepodcast.com. Now, I've got a wonderful team who's helping me make these podcasts. They're Anna Scott Brown and Adam Fowler, who were the producers. We have Brendan Williams, who composed and performed the music. Anna Beth Robinson worked with Ben Warburton on the animations and the visuals. Jill Davis provided the social media and multi platform support. For this particular episode, I'd like to thank Vita Fox, who was the actor who read the wonderful story by C.M. Taylor, The Night Builder. As I record this remotely in lockdown, we've got curriculum and career materials being developed building on this podcast. There by Karen Davenport, Antonio Portis and Jonathan Sanderson at NU STEM at Northumbria University. When they're ready, links will appear on our website, www.inventivepodcast.com. The Inventive Project is from the University of Salford and it is funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. The podcast itself is an overtone production. So it's goodbye from me until the next episode, acoustical engineer Trevor Cox. Inventive.